Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nancy Harowitz. I'm the director of the Elie Wiesel Center for Jewish Studies, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here today. Um, I believe you get extra points for coming in all this rain and the bad weather, so thank you so much. Um, thanks to Brian Friedland for that beautiful piano music. Can we have another round of applause? I'd like to start our afternoon with a brief introduction to Dr. Joan Listernick, who created the program that you're about to hear. Joan holds a PhD in French studies, and she teaches French at the Department of Romance Studies here at Boston University. Joan was uniquely qualified to create this program. She is the daughter of the painter, Judith Listernick, but Joan is also an intellectual voice in her own right about the topic of gender, in the Muslim world and gender didactics, among other topics. Her deep understanding of what this program could mean on, on her mother's paintings and the text of Elie Wiesel, and her striking vision as to how the program could unfold and develop was clear in her very perseverance to make this program happen. She wrote and rewrote proposals, received funding from the Jewish Cultural Endowment, as well as the Elie Wiesel Center. We were so impressed with this program that we decided to co-host it. She researched the best speakers to discuss the subject of suffering and trauma in her mother's works and their intersection with the work of Elie Wiesel. How the arts can illustrate trauma, not as a substitute for testimony, but rather as an intense artistic expression that serves as another way into our hearts, minds, and memories is critically important in our obligation to remember. Joan's project of an interaction between two artists, one visual, one textual, serves to demonstrate the dynamics that can be created through this type of multimedia dialogue. Adding music to the mix can only further intensify these effects, as I think we are going to see later this afternoon. I'm very proud that the Elie Wiesel Center for Jewish Studies is co-hosting this program. It fulfills our mission of bringing meaningful programs to the university committee, uh, community and to the public as well, as our mission of exploring the meaning of the work of Elie Wiesel. We are, in fact, presenting two more programs on Elie Wiesel, entitled Celebrating the Music of Elie Wiesel. One will happen on September 27th and the other on October 29th. Please keep us keep posted for more details on that. Please join me in welcoming Joan Listernick, who will introduce today's program. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming, both our uh, in-person audience and our virtual audience. You're most uh, welcome to be here. First, I would like to thank the Jewish Cultural Endowment and the Elie Wiesel Center for sponsoring this event. Next, I want to thank Professor Nancy Harowitz, who has supported this project every step of the way. And also, I would like to thank Dr. Teresa Cooney and Jenna Reidel for all of their work helping to bring this event to fruition. Elie Wiesel, citing the famous Hasidic master Rabbi Nahum, wrote that it is possible for two people who lived across time and space to have a conversation. That is our aim today, to put into conversation themes in the writings of Elie Wiesel with motifs in Judith Listernick's paintings. The paintings are by no means illustrations of the texts, and the texts are not comments on the paintings, but the resonances between them are rich and arguably provocative. Shortly before her passing, my mother, aware of our impending separation, advised me to travel later in the summer. And so it was in the summer of 2019 that I found myself in Paris, having been invited to the Friday night Shabbat meal at the home of a friend, Dr. Gila Kassou. Gila had studied with Elie Wiesel when she was a doctoral candidate here at Boston University. As an interesting aside, Gila lives in what had been the apartment of Chagall. And over our heads, on her dining room ceiling, is a painting the artist did when he lived there. Whether it was his spirit that guided her, I cannot say. 
But when Gila and I looked at the small book I had given her of paintings my mother had done, it was she who first noted the resonances between the images and themes in some of the writings of Wiesel. Her remark constituted the genesis of this project. I recently received a note from Gila, which I would like to share with you. Gila writes, and I quote, no one can remain indifferent to a painting of Judith Listernick. When I first saw them, I immediately imagined the link with Elie Wiesel and his art of telling Jewish stories. I remember one story in particular, which was recalling the importance of Rabbi Nachman and the Mashal, the capacity to find metaphors and images to make us think deeper about abstract and philosophic notions. Judith Listernick is using the same technique. In appearance, it seems a figurative way of art, whereas her method is deeply symbolic." End quote. When Elie Wiedel was asked how he survived, his response was that his survival was by chance. But the fact that he maintained his sanity was through study. And therefore, where else but in his writing, can we find the processing of his life experience? As for my mother, she never really explained her paintings. On the rare occasions when she spoke about her art, it was largely about technique. But Marilyn Yui Phyllis, a well-known abstract watercolorist, and one of her teachers once said, there is a lot of angst in your work. For the record, I want to make clear that my mother was not a Holocaust survivor. Her suffering had other sources and cannot be compared, but it made its way into her art. Inspired by Dr. Kasu's comment, I began to pour over Wiesel's texts, and this is what I found, an opening to a conversation, almost poetic resonances. One of the themes that we will explore today is that of transmuting suffering through narrative and art. In a more traditional psychoanalytic discourse, art functions to sublimate, to channel unacceptable feelings and desires into a socially acceptable form. Accordingly, art functions as a defense mechanism. It is, however possible, for narrative and art to become not merely a way for the individual to reintegrate society, but moreover, to become part of a process of societal repair, or in other words, tikkun olam. Part of the explanation for the resonances may be Wiesel's and my mother's common interest in Kabbalah or Jewish mysticism. A core understanding in Kabbalah is that something went wrong in the process of creation and that the vessels bearing light shattered. The process of tikkun refers to the rectification or restoration of the broken vessels. Our individual process of repair, which, which in modern terminology may be called reintegration or resilience, could be seen as resonant with this theme. It has been noted that Wiesel's work addressed, has addressed storytelling as an act of tikkun olam. In several of my mother's paintings, I see images of the universe cracked open, the rupture between selfhood and shell, reality and perception, and moreover, the attempt to coalesce fractured shards of glass into an artistic composition. It is possible that these Kabbalistic themes so deeply affected the way the writer and the painter perceived reality that they permeated their work. Dr. Samantha Baskind is Distinguished Professor of Art History at Cleveland State University, where she teaches courses on modern American and Jewish art. She is the author of six books, most recently, The Warsaw Ghetto in American Art and Culture. She is also editor of Dimyonot, Jews and the Cultural Imagination. She is currently working on a book on Moses Jacob Ezekiel, the Jewish sculptor of the Confederacy.
it is hard to do justice to the scope of her work. She studies not only fine art, but also film, theater, fiction, poetry, and graphic literature. Her books include sensitive close reads, an analysis that contextualizes the works in relation to the larger questions they evoke. She interrogates the relationship between art and social and political consciousness and she ex as she explores questions of shifting Jewish American identity. Professor Baskin received her doctorate from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and her undergraduate degree from the University of Pennsylvania. Also, I'm privileged to introduce Rabbi Dr. Nechemia Polin. Rabbi Polin is professor of Jewish thought at Boston's Hebrew College. He is the author of The Holy Fire, the teachings of Rabbi Kalonymus Shapira, the Rebbe of the Warsaw Ghetto, and the Rebbe's daughter. Most recently, he published Stop, Look, Listen, Celebrating Shabbos Through a Spiritual Lens, which explores the transformative effect of Shabbat. He studied at Nair Yisrael Rabbinical College and wrote his doctoral dissertation at Boston University under the supervision of Elie Wiesel. Rabbi Polin is a master teacher. His words, whether in storytelling or analysis, are eloquent, profound, and penetrating. Finally, I want to welcome Brian Friedland, a brilliant pianist who will be improvising on several nikunim, wordless spiritual melodies. Hasidic tradition holds that a nigun opens a window in the soul. People are touched differently, some by art, some by language, and some by music. Wiesel emphasized that teaching is to increase sensitivity. He said that the opposite of art is indifference. I invite you to whichever path calls to you to let yourself be touched by the images, the colors, the shapes, the words, the melodies. Please join me in welcoming Professor Baskin, Rabbi Dr. Polin, and Brian Friedland to Boston University.
worked better before, um, to um, the front of the room, and we're going to start the portion of events, the portion of the event where, um, as my mother's paintings will be projected on a screen, um, there will be readings from the text of Ellie Wiesel. With my laughter, I drive the living to life, the dead to oblivion. With my laughter, I bring together earth and sea, hell and redemption, enigma and light, myself and its shell. The Baal Shem's major concern was to create links at every level. To him, everything that brought people together and consolidated the community was good. Everything that sowed discord was bad. And so he turned a poetic image, the mystical concept of Likut Nitzitzot, the ingathering of dispersed sparks into concrete action. Man's role is to mitigate solitude. Whoever opts for solitude chooses the side of death. That is why in all his tales, wandering nameless beggars play such a particular and important role. They too make people dream. They too are links between men. Every woodcutter may be a prophet in disguise. Every shoemaker, a just man. Every unknown, the Baal Shem. What is man if not a link between Adam and the Messiah, representing more than his own spawn, heralding more than he could wish to receive? A shepherd plays a tune. The Baal Shem relates him to King David. A stranger in rags provokes laughter. The master refers to him as Abraham. It was Yom Kippur, the faithful week from fasting, were waiting for the Rebbe to begin the Musaf prayer. But he too was waiting. An hour went by and another. Impatience turned into anguish. This time the Rebbe was really going too far. It was late. Why was he waiting? When he finally emerged from his meditation, he explained, there is in our midst someone who cannot read. It is not his fault. He has been too busy providing for his family to go to school or study with a teacher. But he wishes you are almighty and know everything. I am weak and ignorant. All I can do is decipher the 22 letters of the sacred tongue. Let me give them to you to make into prayers for me, and they will be more beautiful than mine. The Rebbe raised his voice. And that, brethren, is why we had to wait. God was busy writing. My father loved to write, erase, erase some more, condense 20 words into a single word, or preferably into a comma. Did he suffer? Surely. But he was too proud to show it. Look at his legible, precise handwriting. Every sentence is definitive. He chiseled his words and fitted them like stones into a gigantic tower until they burst apart. Like so many, like so many dismembered bodies tumbling into the precipice. Nachman himself considered his tales sacred. He thought of them as being inspired, perhaps even revealed. His tales? Each contains many others. Imagine a series of concentric circles whose fixed centers are buried in man's innermost being. The eye inside the eye, 
conscience became, becomes silence and peace, memory inside memory. And all are inhabited by princes and sages, by haunted creatures seeking one another, one in another. Following them, we plunge into the supernatural, and yet the word miracle is never pronounced. Every fable contains 10 fables. Every scene is a mosaic whose every fragment is a tale, a scene in itself. One easily loses the thread. There are too many, too many tales inside the tales Rabbi Nachum tells us. Like Nachum's heroes, the reader listener no longer has any notion where he is or what might be awaiting him at the next step. He is helpless, lost in a strange land. The human condition gains in impact at the very moment it breaks apart. Every fragment contains the whole. Every fissure bears witness that man is at once the most fragile and the most tenacious of creatures. Without memory, our existence would be barren and opaque like a prison cell into which no light penetrates, like a tomb which rejects the living. Memory saved the best, and if anything can, it is memory that will save humanity. For me, hope without memory is like memory without hope. A recollection, the time, after the war, the place, Paris. A young man struggles to readjust to life, his mother, his father, his small sister are gone. He is alone, on the verge of despair, and yet he does not give up. On the contrary, he strives to find a place among the living. He acquires a new language. He makes a few friends who, like himself, believe that the memory of evil will serve as a shield against evil, that the memory of death will serve as a shield against death. This he must believe in order to go on, for he has just returned from a universe where God, betrayed by his creatures, covered his face in order not to see. You claim you love me, but you keep suffering. You say you love me in the present, but you're still living in the past. You tell me you love me, but you refuse to forget. At night, you have bad dreams. Sometimes you moan in your sleep. The truth is that I am nothing to you. I don't count. What counts is the past. Not ours, yours. I try to make you happy. An image strikes your memory, and it is all over. You are no longer there. The image is stronger than I. You think I don't know? You think your silence is capable of hiding the hell you carry within you? Maybe you also think that it is easy to live beside someone who suffers and who won't accept any help. The hate that prevails in this divided country reminds me of another, a thousand times bloodier, except that today's is also directed inward. The fanatic militants, the bloodthirsty extremists, the preachers of destruction, the black and red brigades of arbitrary death. Your generation hated the Jews. Now your youth in turn repudiates you, their elders, not for the sake of the Jews, of course, but for the sake of authority. Such are, their such are the dynamics of hate. It overflows. One begins by hating a social group and one ends by despising society. One begins by persecuting, persecuting the Jews and one ends up threatening mankind. All hate becomes self-hate. At around 10 o'clock, the sirens started to go off. Alert! 
the Bloc Alteste gathered us inside the blocks while the SS took refuge in the shelters. As it was relatively easy to escape during an alert, the guards left the watchtowers and the electric current and the barbed wire was cut. The standing order to the SS was to shoot anyone found outside his block. In no time, the camp had the look of an abandoned ship. No living soul in the alleys. Next to the kitchen, two cauldrons of hot steaming soup had been left untended. Two cauldrons of soup, smack in the middle of the road, two cauldrons of soup with no one to guard them, a royal feast going to waste, supreme temptation. Hundreds of eyes were looking at them, shining with desire. Two lambs with hundreds of wolves lying in wait for them. Two lambs without a shepherd, free for the taking, but who would dare? Fear was greater than hunger. Suddenly we saw the door of block 37 open slightly. A man appeared, crawling snake-like in the direction of the cauldrons. Hundreds of eyes were watching his every move. Hundreds of men were crawling with him, scraping their bodies with his on the stones. All hearts trembled, but mostly with envy. He was the one who had dared. He reached the first cauldron. Hearts were pounding harder. He had succeeded. Jealousy devoured us, consumed us. We never thought to admire him, poor hero committing suicide for a ration or two or more of soup. In our minds, he was already dead. Lying on the ground near the cauldron, he was trying to lift himself to the cauldron's rim. Either out of weakness or out of fear, he remained there, undoubtedly to muster his strength. At last, he succeeded in pulling himself up to the rim. For a second, he seemed to be looking at himself in the soup, looking for his ghostly reflection there. Then, for no apparent reason, he let out a terrible scream, a death rattle such as I had never heard before, and with open mouth thrust his head toward the still steaming liquid. We jumped at the sound of the shot. Falling to the ground, his face stained by the soup. The man writhed for a few seconds at the base of the cauldron, and then he was still. As we recite the Haggadah, which retells the exodus of the children of Israel from Egypt, we have the strange feeling that, once again, we are living in biblical times. More than any generation before, my contemporaries have known not only a paroxysm of evil, but also the realization of a promise, not only the kingdom of night, but also the rebirth of a dream, not only the horror of Nazism, but also the end of the nightmare, not only the deaths of Babi Yar, but also the defiance of young Russian Jews, the first to challenge the Kremlin's police state. Sometimes the sheer speed of events makes us real. History advances at a dizzying pace. Man has conquered space, but not his own heart. Have we learned nothing? It seems so. Witness the wars that rage all over the globe, the acts of terror that strike down the innocent, the children who are dying of hunger and disease in Africa and Asia every day. Why is there so much hatred in the world? Why is there so much indifference to hatred, to suffering, to the anguish of others?
embodying man's eternal quest for meaning, justice, and truth, Adam remains the contemporary and the companion of all men, of all generations. Every one of us yearns to recapture some lost paradise. Every one of us bears the mark of some violated, stolen innocence. All our passions and sorrows, all our failings, Adam already knew. Outside paradise, Adam became real. Rejected by God, he drew closer to Eve. Never were the two so united. Suddenly they discovered a purpose to their existence, to perfect the world which until then had been no more than created, to use the experience that had been theirs, to transmit, to communicate by deed and word, to safeguard, to tell the tale, omitting nothing, forgetting nothing. After the fall, he was a broken man. One part of him remained in paradise while the other continued to dream of it with nostalgia. One part of him yearned for God, the other for escape from God. Expelled from paradise, Adam and Eve did not give in to resignation. In the face of death, they decided to fight by giving life, by conferring a meaning on life. One moment of life contains eternity. One moment of life is worth eternity. According to Jewish tradition, creation did not end with man. It began with him. When he created man, God gave him a secret. And that secret was not how to begin, but how to begin again. In other words, it is not given to man to begin. That privilege is God's alone but it is given to man to begin again. And he does so every time he chooses to defy death and side with the living. Thus, he justifies the ancient plan of the most ancient of men, Adam, to whom we are bound both by the anguish that oppressed him and the defiance that elevated him above the paradise we shall never enter.
um, this brings us, let me see. Do you want to sit down? This brings us to the discussion portion of our event. And my first question is directed particularly to Professor Baskind. Professor Baskin, would you please situate my mother's work in art history and talk about some of the artistic influences on her work? And in addition, if you could say a few words about the theme of resilience, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Want me to go up? Yes. Okay. Can I, is this on? Can everyone hear me? Great. So I was really struck by... Some people can't hear? Wait, can some... Can you hear? All right. I was really struck by these images, and which I had not been familiar with until Joan introduced me to them. And I found so many resonances within art history it would have been so nice to have a conversation with Judith to ask her what she looked at, what influenced her over time. So I, I wanted to sort of, sort of mine the past briefly before we get into some more discussions. You just saw this particular painting and the tables were turned. And I noticed that it was very expressionistic, surely. I was thinking of some German expressionist artists, if anybody's familiar with that work from like the 19 teens like Ernst Ludwig Kirchner. But what also interested me is this mask. And perhaps one, you know, we're thinking of Purim when it comes to this mask. But also, you know, placing her within art history, masks were vitally important for artists in the early part of the 20th century. And the most influential artist in the 20th century, some would say, is Pablo Picasso. So while I can't ask Judith what she saw, I know she surely knew Pablo Picasso. He had so many styles over time. And in fact, the masks looks very much like the color scheme he used for a period of time as well. But I did want to bring this painting in because it's, some say, one of the most influential paintings in the easily the first half of the 20th century, where we see Picasso putting masks on these women. So they're, they're kind of dangerous. These are African and Iberian masks. And here's just um, Pablo, do you want to come sit down and see it? I don't blame you, it's great art. <laughs> that Pablo Picasso's head on the left, you know, he painted masks, he used them as studies. And then we have um, a, a, mask that, a mask that he would have looked at, an example that he would have seen. So thinking about masks, it brought me to, look at the, look at the similar color schemes here. And this is an Emile Nolde. He was a German expressionist. This is still life with masks. He made a lot of still lives with masks. It's not a funny slide. It's actually that distorted. And the, it was reminded me of the colors. I don't, again, I don't know that she knew it, but there was this, just a striking resonance between them. So I think we'll talk about more when we get back together. Why masks? Is it Purim? Are there the masks that we, you know, why do we wear masks? You know, what does that have to do with resilience? I'm not entirely sure. I think we need to have a dialogue about it. But I also, <clears throat> I really liked this painting, Attitude. I should mention, she worked with watercolor most of the time. And why did, and I'm using her first name because we got, we got Joan, we have Judith, it gets confusing. And normally we talk about artists by their last names. But why watercolor? Judith, had a long-term battle with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And she, she learned that oil painting could be bad. The oil could be bad for her. So watercolor, which is a you know, much less aggressive medium, both on one's body as well as on a canvas or a piece of paper, was a more natural medium for her. And watercolor is, and this is quoting a very famous um, art critic, the most recalcitrant of mediums. Because you put a mark down and it dries. Oil you can play with a little. But it's, it's such a hard medium to work with. It's really impressive stuff. And so this is great. Um, in the history of American art, Winslow Homer is considered the best at watercolor. But there are many others. So let's think. This is watercolor. So we want to keep that in mind. 
And I just wanted, so we have a portrait of a woman in a chair, all right, by Judith. But then we have a portrait of a woman in a chair here by a different artist, Franz Hals. That's, this is 17th century Dutch art. And just I wanted you to see how, what, what she's doing radically. What is the diff, you know, the change? We don't know who the sitter is in the Franz Hals. We don't know who the sitter is in Judith's work either. And this is just like the, look how she's subverting conventions in the history of art. Perhaps influenced, again, it always comes back to Picasso in the 20th century. Um, I should mention Picasso is not American. He's, a Sp he's Spanish, he worked in France. This is woman with a dog, another woman in a chair. And look at that, I think, you know, the way that her head is turned and sort of the, the play on form and shape. I see something there that's similar. And let me tell you, I could show you Picasso after Picasso, but the more I looked, you know, just, it really felt and there was an affinity here. So a few words also, a few more words about watercolor and America. Um, John Marin is also considered to be a really important American watercolorist. And when I was, you know, looking at Judith's work, sort of the movement that we see over there, the movement that we see over here and sort of the, the, the hatch, you know, a little bit of the hatch marks or the thick line, lots of different, oh, can you hear me? All right, great. Lots of different, you know, a sense of movement was really perfected by Marin in the early part of the 20th century. Um, this is actually a late work by him. But I also was struck by Judith's use of darker colors in her watercolors. And her watercolors were sometimes a pretty big size. They weren't that intimate. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm saying it's impressive. Um, watercolors tend to work on a smaller size. So when I think about, you know, wh where do we have, what has resilience? How, how do we read resilience in some of these works? I think there's resilience in that we have a woman who in her early 30s started painting. She wanted to be an artist. Her dad wasn't so supportive of that, even though he was an artist. But when he died, he left behind um, his paints and his canvases, and she took up painting and with a passion, in fact. So and throughout all this, no matter how sick, sick Judith was, she, she stayed connected to the medium. It helped ground her. And I learned this from talking to Joan, and I really appreciated that conversation. Um, she was in a ac car accident once, and she, you know, what, what was she going to do? Should she go to the hospital? You know, she's like, oh, I have an art class. Forget it. I'm just going to my art class. You know, she had a real commitment to her art, and so her art became a path for her to work through what she needed to work through, and this connects obliquely to the Holocaust um, for me. I just want to say, um, a philosopher named Theodore Adorno said, there can be no poetry after Auschwitz. And this is something that I teach and I talk about a lot. And what he meant was, you know, what, there can be, what can be beautiful? What, what can we do after um, the Holocaust, what he, by, what he meant by Auschwitz? And artists, and especially Jewish artists, and I'm a specialist in Jewish American art, and Judith is a Jewish American artist who's not in the canon, whose work we don't really know. Um, and the point is that art can make things more beautiful after the Holocaust. It can't describe the Holocaust, but there's so many other ways that we can use art to make meaning. And we can talk about that more when we talk as a group. Do I have how many more minutes do I have? I can keep going? Yeah. Two more minutes? Three more minutes? Three more. Whatever you want. She was also a Chinese brush painter. You know, she, she took up Chinese, Chinese brush painting, which is, you know, we can see that this is much more thinly painted than some of the other works. And these are just, these are, you know, they're very delicate. As opposed to, in my last little bit of time here, this work. So this is an oil on canvas. And we haven't looked at any of her oil on canvas yet. We looked at a mixed media work, but this oil on canvas really suggested to me the abstract expressionists. And abstract expressionism is a dominant movement in the second half of the 20th century. It really changed not just the history of American art, but the history of um, 
Western art as a whole. And look at how she really adopts this, expression, uh, this abstract expressionist brushstroke. It's much later. This is from 2010. The abstract expressionists are big in the 50s, really. And I thought about Adolf Gottlieb. I don't know if she knew his work. He was Jewish also. And in fact, most of the abstract, major ma abstract expressionists happened to be Jewish. I'm not saying that they're ab they were, were abstract expressionists because they were Jewish. But we have to think about why Barnett Newman, Adolf Gottlieb, Lee Krasner, Elaine de Kooning, and so on were Jewish. Anyway, I, I was interested in this, you know, this emotional brushstroke. Abstract expressionism and abstraction allows artists to convey something, you know, you know, really at their core. Abstract expressionism was about personal expression, but it wasn't, you know, representational and something that we're used to seeing. So I thought about this um, connection as well. And so I think, in sum, we have to think about what's the function of art and why is art made and why is art made after the Holocaust and what can it tell us after the Holocaust and what does Judith Listernick's work tell us? Thank you. Sure. What we're going to do now is go back to three of the paintings, one by one, and have a discussion about the resonances between the art and the writing. Uh, when I picked the text to go with the paintings, I had some things in mind, but it may not be exactly what our speakers see, may not be what you see. Um, it's not a direct one-to-one -one correspondence. As I said at the beginning, it's not an illustration. But there's a lot of things to discuss. So we're going to go back first to the first, very first painting, and the tables were turned. And my question to both speakers, maybe uh, we'll start, we're going to start in general with um, Professor Baskin, who's going to say a few words about the art. And then we're going to ask the same question to Rabbi Dr. Polin, who's going to talk more about the Jewish themes and the connection with Wiesel. So in this painting, um, the tables were turned. Professor Baskin, what are your thoughts? You started to speak about it, but you said it, there was more to say. I think there is. I think something that's important. Oh, can, can everyone hear me? Is that better? All right, great. I think that when we think about paintings, a lot of them are just titled, untitled, especially in the you know, later part of the 20th century. So when we think about this work and we think about it in relationship to Elie Wiesel's um, writings and the tables were turned. What does that mean? And also think about why mixed media might have been used. And I'm thinking, I think more about like, you know, process and product. And it's from, you know, 1995. And size is important too. This is 37 by 58 inches. That's huge, right? This is the, the like one of the biggest works. I, is this the biggest work she ever made? Yes. Okay, so this is the biggest work she ever made. Hmm, why this subject in the biggest work that she ever made? And so when I do look at it, I do think about masks, and it does evoke Purim for me if I'm thinking it from a Jewish-American perspective. But perhaps in relationship to the writings more closely, that Joan, is, Joan had something else in mind. So I'm curious, in this case, what else, what else do the two of you think about this work of art, especially in relationship to Wiesel's writings? Uh, well, in one of the uh, excerpts, he's, Wiesel specifically writes about shell, the outside and the inside. The, it evokes the image that uh, one presents to the world versus one's soul. And in all cultures, or almost all cultures, there are holidays where you wear masks. So it's Purim in, in the Jewish celebration, but there's also Mardi Gras. And all along, it's because this theme is really universal. What is the image we choose to present to the outside, and what is our core? What is the distance between them? And that's all in the mask, which points towards the existence of our having something inside that's different, that's our soul. Um, but Rabbi Pullen, what are your thoughts on this painting? So, I thought, Perhaps I, I'm sorry. 
maybe I'll be better heard if I. Um, okay. Let's just. Am I coming through? Yes. Coming through. So, yeah. Um, well, Purim has already been evoked, and um, it, it's actually um, very clearly pointed to by the by the title, and the tables were turned. Uh, the the theme of the book of Esther is in Hebrew venahafochu, um, and things were overturned. That's to say, the structure of the narrative is that every aspect that seemed to threaten the Jews turned um, not not only with the Jew, with the Jews saved, but there was a mirror image reversal. Um, Haman who had been the most trusted confidant of the king, turns out to be the, the uh, subverter and the one who emerges first crestfallen, humiliated, um, and eventually put to death by the king who he thought um, was his most uh, trusted booster. And Esther was and remained the, the king's beloved wife. But the theme of the, of the book is, uh, this is a refrain, lo higida Esther et amavi et moladita. Esther did not reveal her people and the origins of her birth. Is to say, she didn't tell anybody that she was Jewish until the very last moment. And the reason for that is clear because otherwise, the element of surprise, there was, in our terminology, a big reveal, right? <laughs> right? And there wouldn't have been the big reveal had she said, oh, by the way, you know, it would be really nice if we could set up a little kosher kitchen in the palace or something. No, 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 no. There was nothing about that. And uh, um, it was only, it was only that that hiding, which is of course a mask in its own right, uh, that enabled the dramatic uh, crescendo, that, that, that moment of revelation, to take place at the very end of the book. Um, similarly, it has been noted that um, the book of Esther is, only, is the only, or perhaps nearly the only, um, book in Hebrew scripture where the name of God is not mentioned. But tradition has it that hovering in the background is somehow the hand of divinity, the hand of meaning, the hand of significance. Something is happening here beyond what the humans see. And um, as I was preparing this, um, I, 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 I was reminded of a, a, a striking line from an eight, late 18th century German poet, uh, Novalis. And he, he's quoted as saying, in a work of art, chaos must shimmer through the veil of order. Chaos must shim shimmer through the veil of order. And we see that. But I would like to say that in many biblical books and in the writings of Elie Wiesel and, and in the um, uh, amazing painting that we have in front of us, there's a reversal there as well. Order is shining through the reverse, through, through, the, through the veil, through the veil of chaos. Um, another Hungarian Jew, very, very different trajectory of life, but still with many similarities. Um, I'm thinking of Arthur Kessler, um, was, did not suffer in the Holocaust in the same way as Elie Wiesel, but certainly suffered in the Spanish Civil War, communism, long story, but the point here is he wrote a book called The Act of Creation, and he advances a, 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 a theory that he calls bisociation, and he says creativity happens in all domains of life, whether artistic creativity, scientific creativity, or laughter, by the hiding of an association that eventually is revealed. And you see this in science all the time, where two apparently disparate domains come together in a surprising way. Artistically, certainly, 
uh, you see that. And in laughter, the, the only way to kill a joke is to tell the punchline at the beginning. Right? So in other words, it's only funny if you hide the punchline. So the, that's where masks are coming in in, um, in the book of Esther. And I want to mention one other association that I have with the writings of Elie Wiesel. And that's at, at the very end um, of Night, perhaps his most famous work. And by the way, I'm, um, I'm looking forward to, to a new translation, a new edition of Night, and actually all the works coming out from Germany by one of his students, Reinhold Boschke. Any event, the way we have it now, at the very end, Eliezer, that's essentially uh, um, Eli Wiesel, has been liberated from Buchenwald and finds himself in a hospital hovering for two weeks between life and death. Summoning all his strength, he gets up, wanting to see himself in the mirror hanging on the wall for the first time since the ghetto. And so he, he, he says, from the depths of the mirror, a corpse gazed back at me. The look in his eyes as they stared into mine has never left me. And was, he's shocked by what he sees, right? It's like he, he, he hasn't seen a mirror, uh, hasn't had the occasion to see, and it's not him. Oh my God, it's a ghost. It's an apparition. It, it, it's a skeleton. And yet he says, has never left me. So here's what I'd like to say. The last word me makes it clear that the shattered self is not to be identified with the narrator. The corpse that gazed from the mirror, his eyes were not mine. The narrator has, has, re, has recovered self-awareness, has found a voice, has a face beyond the image in the mirror. The mirror did more than reflect the present in inexorable fixity. By its very starkness, it broke open a window on the future. You mentioned the famous Kabbalistic myth of the shattering of, um, of the vessels and the lifting up of the sparks. The mirror, the mirror of the corpse was shattered in the last line of night because there was something beyond that. And this is what, this is what every mask does. It hides, it reveals, but perhaps even more important, it suggests that there is a deeper level. There are always deeper levels. And despair never needs to be the final level. There can always be a return to hope, to expectation, to future, to possibility. This is what we see here. This is what we see in every line written by Elie Wiesel. Thank you very much. Very powerful words. Um, we're going to look next again at a painting we saw at the beginning a few times and in Professor Baskin's, could we have some help, um, presentation, Lunar Festival. And I'm going to ask Professor Baskin first to say a few words about this. Can everyone hear me? OK, great. Reasons, but especially because Joan told me that it took your mom a year to make. So that was that intrigued me because of all of the works of art. Is this working? Can you hear me okay? No. No. I don't. Oh, great. Yeah. So let's try that again. Joan told me that of all the works that her mom made, this one. So this one took a year to make, but. I, I was wondering why it would take a year to make, because it's, it's a series of abstract gestures, which in, for the abstract expressionists, you know, when I say that, I mean like Jackson Pollock or Franz Klein. They, you know, they worked very spontaneously. 
So I'm like, I wish I could get a better sense of what, what she was thinking about, what each gesture meant. Like, do you know if she made studies for these? Yes. She made studies for this. In general, she made studies. So she's making studies to think about where the perfect gesture is. And, you know, that's just an intriguing process. So at this point, you know, we wonder about what is her process. We know what the product is, but we're not sure how she got there. And I like that she titled her works rather than just untitled or untitled nine or, you know, it goes, you know, it gets a little bit excessive. But Lunar Festival, of course, you know, as if we're looking at this from a Jewish lens, when we think of festival, lots of festivals come to our minds. And especially, you know, the Lunar Festival, which I will leave Rabbi Poland to talk about a little bit more, like the, the you know, the, the loon, all the, um, Adoration of the Moons, for example, I thought about Max Weber, if anybody is familiar with his work or not, a major Jewish American artist. He made an Adoration of the Moon and a lot of those, a lot of rabbis who are looking up at the moon. So I suggest, you know, checking out his work. At some point you can find it online. And I just didn't want to muddy this particular talk with it. So I feel like Judith looks to the past and looks to the history of art and looks to the past, looks to Judaism. I, you know, I do see those resonances and brings them to her particular art, brings them more up to date to her present at, the particular, at that particular time. And I'd also like you to think about when you're looking at art, you know, we have titles, what is the function of the art? You know, this is most likely meant to, this was meant to be decorative. It wasn't a portrait of somebody, you know, to decorate, you know, for a house to memorialize someone. But the color scheme, you know, with this overwhelming color scheme of red and this interest in putting a frame around it, as well as, you know, little hints of different colors peeking out, like why yellow, why red, why black, and, you know, of course, when we think of lunar, we think maybe of like a little bit of yellow, and we think of sun, and we think of moon. But, you know, all of these formal considerations go into understanding this particular painting, in my opinion. Thank you very much. Uh, here we go. Rabbi Polin, um, do you have a few words to say about this painting? Um, yeah. Uh, very, very striking for me, this is. Um, I don't want to choose, but one of my favorites, there's a great dynamism, um, the energy uh, uh, um, of the reds and the very different color scheme in the center. And um, you know what, if it's okay, I think I'm going to, I'd look at it while I speak, if I may. Um, so I noticed the rectangle, and um, the rectangle is very, very striking because it is made w with a straight edge. It is made with a ruler, but um, all the other shapes are, are uh, circular or fluid. There's a tremendous fluidity, and so you have this sort of combination between uh, um, human meticulous um, uh, creativity and uh, a more vibrant, perhaps natural creativity um, which is depicted here. Um, abstract, yes, but somehow, maybe because of the title, um, I see one of the sacrificial animals, perhaps a bull that is brought to the temple um, in ancient Israel uh, during, during the lunar festivals in particular. And <laughs> is it my imagination? I just, you know, I see, the, yeah, and then perhaps something like a horn stick legs, um, some, uh, something of that, um, perhaps a human figure riding, um, not so abstract. So um, I am reminded of a okay. I want to use this without getting, without getting reverb and feedback. Let's see if I can do it. Um, and I don't want to have my back to anybody, so maybe, maybe I'll stand. Well, I'll try here. Um, I'm reminded of a midrash which Professor Wiesel um, drew upon in his writings at, as well. Originally, the sun and the moon 
were created of equal size. And the moon complained and said, you know, how can this be? We are both called the great lights and how can we share, how can we share the heavens equally? And God said, okay, very, very good point, moon. Why don't you become smaller? <laughs> this is why we learn never volunteer at a meeting, right? Never, never. Yeah. Um, so so um, uh, the moon complained bitterly, and there's this Talmudic dialogue between the sun and, and uh, um, between God and the moon, and I, I'm going to condense this now. And God tries to console the moon, and the moon is unconsolable. And finally, God sort of throws up the divine hands and says, okay, I, I agree. Basically, I, have, I the divine, have, have sinned. And bring an offering for me every month. Bring a sin offering because I diminished the moon. Um, the great thinker, philosopher, theologian, uh, Emmanuel Levinas, who Elie Wiesel knew from Paris, um, wrote an essay on this called Divine Kenosis. Kenosis means, it's a theological term that the divine basically incarnates into the human condition so that divinity can share the pain and the suffering as well as the joys and creativity of being human. And this midrash effectively evokes that idea. So the moon um, is diminished. The moon only has reflected light. The moon disappears every month. But it's equally true that the moon returns every single month. That's why new moon is the great festival, because it's the return after seeming disappearance. It's the return to life after seeming death. It's the spark of divinity where there only seem to be despair, humiliation, and death. That's the midrash, and that's the deeper meaning of the new moon festival. So that's really what I see here. Um, you, you see this very, very powerful white rectangle with dynamism and, and life in the middle breaking out and, 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 and saying, I'm not going to be constrained um, by any rigid matrix. I'm going to move out and I'm going to return. Um, this is, again, evident in everything Professor Wiesel wrote. And I have to say, I was privileged to be in his classroom for four years in, um, in every moment of his teaching. There was never an attempt to suppress or diminish or negate or marginalize the enormity and the impossibility and the pain of what happened. And at the same time, there was never a moment of despair. There was always movement to hope and to new birth. Thank you so much. We have one more painting that we're going to discuss. I want to say one thing first. Oh, okay. Go I ahead. had another. I just, I just want to say that art hist. There's no one meaning in a painting. So, you know, that's why there can be 50 books about Rembrandt. As long as it's grounded in like the visual, and Rabbi Pollan was great at like, you know, this is what I see, and this is why, you know, this is my interpretation. So you may all have a different interpretation, and that's okay. I tell my students that. I'm like, that's okay, just ground it in the visual. And so art history in that way is a soft science, right? As long as you take the basics of what art history is, and you look at all the different elements of what makes up a painting or a sculpture, and then you can go with it. And I think you did a great job doing that. I really enjoyed that um, interpretation. And abstraction especially lends itself to open-ended meanings. Really, you know, you can take that to different places. And so I think there's a reception afterwards, and we can talk about it if other people, you know, just feel differently. But know that there's no right or wrong answer. Thank you. And it's interesting, you know, I grew up with these paintings, and I'm learning so much from both speakers to see them in a different light and to see even more than I had realized. So turning to this one, Dryad's Reflection, which I had associated with an Edenic vision in Wiesel. Uh, Professor Baskin, do you have a few words to say? I really like this piece. So, you know, not that we're supposed to have a favorite, right? But I'm, I'm really drawn to it. 
because there seems to me to be so much going on, but it's a watercolor. So it's like a laying, layering of watercolors and just like the sense of motion. I think that it's just technically pretty sophisticated. So that's why I particularly like it from that angle, but even like the colors that are peeking through and what, you know, just the, what do those mean? Like, how can we interpret that? And, you know, you know, something related to Eden and to paradise, surely. Um, of course, we have a title that's also, you know, grounding us in some way. And I do think it's, a, it's a, not a perfected landscape. And there are so many perfected landscapes in the history of art, especially oil paintings and, you know, works that are made for the church. But and because works are not usually made for the synagogue. I should probably say something about this very briefly. You know, sometimes people say, why have there not been like Jewish artists like Michelangelo or Leonardo? And there's, you know, the second commandment has been confused Jews for a long time. The second commandment that thou should not make any graven images. Well, that means not images that we worship, not, we can make other images, but it's precluded Jewish art, Jewish art making to a degree, however, the other reason we don't have like a long history of Jewish art and why these work, you know, works like this by, you know, Jewish Americans, especially they're so important adding to the history of Western art, which is really the history of Western Christian art. Um, if you're people on the run, you know, it's a, you're not going to take your oil canvases, like the big painting that you might have made and like put it under your arm and race to the next country. So you're not going to be killed in a pogrom. So th there probably was a lot more art that was made over time, and it's the ritual objects that are intimate and small that Jews were able to take from place to place. So this kind of new interpretation of Eden or landscapes by Jewish American artists over time, and Jewish American artists really came to this, you know, really made a difference from the beginning of the 20th century to the current time. We have a phenomenal um, history of Jewish American art, and if we have time, I can tell you a little more about it and where I think Joan fits in that. Judith fits in that, and Joan too as the offspring. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sure. Rabbi Poland, do you have a few words to say about this painting? Yeah. Thank you, and with, thank you so much, uh, really beautiful. If, if, with your permission, I, I, I also want to look at the, yeah. So, thank you. So, I'm not blocking you? Okay, great, thank you. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, really um, e Edenic uh, watercolor and, and this flowing everywhere, um, just as uh, Genesis uh, chapter 2 and 3 describe the Garden of Eden, um, river flowing out of Eden, four branches. Um, but if this is Eden, it's interesting that there's, as far as I can see, there's one very leafy, very verdant, uh, very lush, but one tree. And we know from Genesis that, <laughs> I don't know why I'm thinking of that, that, um, you know, it ain't necessarily so. Well, uh, <laughs> but if we're with Genesis, we're, we're with Genesis, it is necessarily so. And there were, um, and there were two trees. So why here do we have one tree? So here I want to evoke the Hasidic tradition that, that was so central, of course, for Professor Wiesel. We have the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And the Hasidic masters boldly interpret the sin of the Garden of Eden. You know, famously, Adam, Adam ate of the fruit doesn't say apple, he, he ate of the fruit. Eve and Adam ate of the fruit, everything followed from that. There's a, a in particular, I'm thinking of a Hasidic master, Raveli Melech Shapiro of Grozitsk, uh, died in 1892. And he writes in his book, Divrei Eli Melech, he says, you know, the sin was not eating from the tree of knowledge. The sin was stopping too soon. The sin was only eating from the tree of knowledge and refraining from eating from the tree of life. 
what God really wants, the desideratum, is to unite the two trees. You need the knowledge. Otherwise, the Garden of Eden is going to be awfully boring. Right? Uh, it, the history gets kicked off, of course, when, when we leave the Garden of Eden and everything happens, the bad and the good, the temptation, the nobility, the grace, the vision, the opportunity, and the dark side of life, and everything, everything together in, in, in this chaos that we call human existence. But if somehow we are to get back to the garden, we need to unite the two trees. And the biblical exemplar of that is in another book about gardens, the Song of Songs, where the division between divinity and humanity, and the division between Adam and Eve, you know, it, Adam points the, who is the first person to point, to point the finger? Adam, she made me do it, right? That was, that, that was part of the original sin. So, so that division, and the other division was between humanity and, and the environment. And they were, they were supposed to tend the world, not to corrupt the world, not to destroy the world, not to dis despoil the world, not to, if I'm, may, may I be contemporary, not to put, pump, pump so much carbon into the world that we become one huge, unlivable hothouse. It's, it's the Song of Songs, Rabbi Akiva's favorite book. And Rabbi Akiva was Elie Wiesel's perhaps favorite Talmudic figure writes about him so extensively. And he says, Song of Songs is the Holy of Holies. So I see the Holy of Holies here. And I, 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 I see Akiva, I see Eli, I see um, a great artist, I see the opportunity of taking two disparate trees and making one tree. I see, again, the lushness and the beauty and the green verdancy of hope. That was really beautiful. Thank you so much. So we've raised a lot of very thought-provoking issues, and we will have a Q&A. But in order to give you a few minutes, both the in-person audience and the virtual audience, to collect your thoughts and formulate your questions, we are going to have another brief musical interlude. Uh, and then I will walk around and take some questions from the audience for our panel.
Okay, I'm going to start with our in-person audience. If anyone has a question, would you please raise your hand? And I will come over so you can speak into the mic. And if you could say your name first. My name is Jean Donahue. And this, is that lady, this is the lady who photographed my mother's paintings. So I, this is not my first acquaintance with this particular painting. But what I'm getting from it right now, last September I was in the Greek islands. We hiked up to a monastery at the top of one of the islands. And it's a Greek Orthodox. And it's the cave where St. John, or John, wrote the Gospels, the Christian Gospel, the New Testament Gospel. And as you would come out from the cave, the monastery, there was a baptismal font, which I see circular, but you could look down onto the Aegean, which is the blue, and the golden green is the town at the foot of the mountain. And um, that's an olive tree. The leafy, lots of leafy trees. So um, I know it's, it doesn't connect to what you've mainly been discussing here. Um, but I do want to add that when I was a student here in the 80s, I did attend several of Elie Wiesel's lectures. And I was very impressed with him. Thank you so much, Jean. And as, as Professor Baskin said, there's a lot to see. It's not just one uh, interpretation. Thank you so much. And thank you for doing the ph photographs. OK, I'm coming, Joel. Hello, Jeff. Thanks so much for doing this. Uh, this is a little bit different question, but can you talk a little bit about your mother personally? Like, what was her motivations? What inspired her? Like, what milieu did she work in? Was she like uh, solo, at work alone, like sort of isolated, or was she like, in an artistic movement, like you know, who was she, like, I'm just trying to figure out what world she was coming from. Oh, okay. So um, Joel Bloom asked what the background, the background of my mother's life, what inspired her to paint? Did she paint alone? Who did she work with? My mother traveled all over the country by herself to do art workshops. Uh, originally, when she went to college, her parents said to her, a woman has to make a living, do something practical. So she had a degree in library science from Simmons. But she had the soul of an artist. And so when she started working in the library, although she did meet my father at the Tufts Medical School Library, um, but eventually when she started as a job, it really did not inspire her. And she um, found art was her passion. And she traveled all over the country and traveled with some of the top artists in America uh, and got a lot of support around her work. It's very, very hard to choose the life of an artist that she did talk about. And you have to have someone tell you, it's OK, you should be doing it. This is what you're meant to do. And she got that from her teachers. Thank you for the question. Anyone else? Hi, um, my question is that, well, first of all, let me say this is really a wonderful program. I've learned a lot, and I think a couple of my students I noticed are here, and they've been taking notes, so I think we'll be discussing this more on Tuesday in class. I do have a question for Rabbi Poland about your interpretation of Dryad's Reflection, which I found very rich and evocative. But what about the title? A Dryad is, after all, after all a wood nymph. So can that be brought into a Jewish interpretation? <laughs> that is deep. Uh, yeah. Uh, are we live? Are we on? Okay. Yeah. So, well, thank you so much. Here again, I evoke the Kabbalistic tradition. The more rationalist tradition within Judaism um, maintains a, a, a very severe borderline, really patrols the border between the divine, the human, the animate, and the inanimate, 
and humanity and the rest of creation. In the Kabbalah, it's different. There, there is something unique about being human, that's for sure. But at the same time, we all share those sparks. And we, uh, uh, one of the ways of looking at the trajectory of life is that the journey of life is the journey of finding the sparks that are relevant to the mending of our own souls. And those are sparks of light that other people have, but also sparks in inanimate objects, and certainly sparks um, that exist in great things, in particular trees. So here is an interesting datum. Um, in the creation story and elsewhere throughout the Bible, God creates the world on Genesis 1, as you know, by speech. And God said, and God said, and God said. Um, those of us who've been some time in Boston may have seen those, uh, those, uh, those MIT t-shirts where Ma uh, Maxwell's three laws are emblazoned on the t-shirt and, and God said, and God said, and God said, and there was light. But the point is whether God spoke Hebrew words or whether God spoke uh, the language of partial differential equations, <laughs> Pro probably both, I would imagine. <laughs> um, it, it, it's all about cognition and, and, and something that can be captured in words and or in, in, um, in symbols. But in, in, the, in the Garden of Eden narratives, it said God planted the trees. God planted the trees. It says, Vayita Hashem Elohim. God planted the trees specifically. If you look in Psalm 104, God, God planted the, tree, the cedars of Lebanon. Arze Levanon Asher Nata. So the image is God gets, gets into the, you know, sort of rolls up to the divine sleeves kneels down in, in the mud and has this sapling and plants the trees. There's something divine about the trees that's in the, I would say, the core biblical text, not the philosophical tradition that really, as I say, pr pr patrols these boundaries, but in the biblical original text and in the Kabbalistic tradition, all of nature and particularly trees are suffused with, with being, um, with significance, with personhood. You know, it's not for nothing that, that um, Martin Buber, who was of course so deeply influenced by the Hasidic tradition, has in, in his I and Thou this vignette about having a personal relationship with a tree. Yeah, yeah, th 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 there's a whole vignette about having an I-Thou relationship with a tree. So um, Rabbi Nachman um, specifically says, do your, do your personal meditations out in the forest, and not just in a field, but in a forest, and by, by a tree. The vitality of trees is, is, is something that is deeply spiritual. Spe trees have integrity, dignity, nobility, and I would even say personhood. And again, going back to the biblical text, it, it's the first, the first um, perhaps one of the first um, ecological mandates anywhere in Jewish scripture, I can't speak for other scriptures, is in the book of Deuteronomy, where it says, Sieging a city with a great towering wall. Don't make the mistake of cutting down a fruit tree. So the divinity of trees 
It's, it, it, it's through the entire tradition into, into the Kabbalah and into Hasidism. So I am totally comfortable with the wood nymphs. Absolutely. <laughs>
I'm really impressed with the different styles that she worked in over time, and it's been a pleasure. And I also got to learn more about Ellie Wiesel and you know seeing the resonances between the the two works, the two different two different art forms. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Baskin. Thank you, Rabbi Dr. Polin, and thank you, Brian Friedland. Um, and thank you everybody who came in person and virtually, but this event is not done because there is a reception in the room that faces the river and Boston, just outside on this floor. So I invite everybody who's here to join us. We have coffee, tea, desserts, and uh, maybe some time to ask some follow-up questions if you have some. And I want to thank our online audience also for joining us. And, um, and again, Professor Harowitz, the Ali Wiesel Center, and the Jewish Cultural Endowment.